Anybody glad to be in the house this morning? Come on, make some noise. Yeah. Always glad to be in God's house. You guys sounded so wonderful this morning. It was actually so good and refreshing to hear your voices worship instead of just being overwhelmed uh, with the music. So that was really good. I want to welcome everybody to the service this morning, uh, those who are here for the first time, those watching us online, and those of you that are in the aud auditorium and you've been here every Sunday almost, uh, welcome to worship this morning. Man, we're so glad to have you worship with us today. We got a lot to do today, so just going to dive right in. Uh, this coming Saturday uh, is going to be our men's breakfast. So I'm inviting all the men. Yeah, let's, let's give it up. Come on, guys. Yes. Um, I'm inviting all the men in our church, and they are friends, so you're free to bring a friend, a brother, a son. Uh, I'm inviting all the men to make sure that you are there for the breakfast meeting this coming Saturday. It'll be at La Madeleine Restaurant, which is at uh, Phelan Town Center, and time is 9 a.m. If you want to RSVP, which we encourage you to do, that way we know the head count. Simply text the word men to the number. When you text that word, you're not going to get a response right away. That's fine. But we will have your information. And sometime this week, we're going to send you details. The breakfast cost is just $10 per person. You pay for yourself. And, um, and we're going to have a time of fellowship, a time of prayer, and a time of encouraging one another. So once again, men, I'm inviting you and I'm encouraging you to take advantage of this opportunity. Go ahead and uh, screenshot or take a picture of that number uh, so that you can send a text or you can just grab your phone right now and send a text. And then next Sunday, next Sunday, uh, next Sunday will be a historic, a special Sunday for us. Uh, for the very first time in the history of our church, we're going to have a guest speaker. We're going to have a guest speaker next Sunday. And the guest speaker is none other than Pastor Brad Wilkerson. Uh, he's an amazing pastor, uh, he's an excellent communicator, and he is one of our overseers. If you want to know more about him, you just can go on our website, theconnectchurch.tv, go on the About Us, and you see where it says Overseers. You can read a little bit more about Pastor Brad. He pastors a church called uh, Rock Creek Church in the Dallas area. I cannot wait for him to come pour into us. I'm asking you to do two things. Number one, I'm encouraging everybody to make sure that you are there because I know that he's going to bless you. It's going to be a blessing. But also, I'm encouraging you to invite somebody. If every single person would invite somebody, that would be a good opportunity to expose others to what God is doing in our church and for them to be blessed as well. Who says amen to that? Okay, if you will do that, say amen. amen. If you won't do it, say I'm thinking about it. I'm, I'm kidding, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. All right, all right. Here are some ways, you know, we've been talking about ways that we, we want to bless you this summer. Uh, we have some things coming up. Uh, I want to say this off the bat. Uh, for students of high school and middle school, we've got something for you. Go ahead and put this date, and parents, go ahead and put this date on your calendar, Saturday, July the 23rd. We're going to have a game night. Uh, for students, going to be games. So we'll give you the details as we go on, but I just wanted you to take note of that date. If you are interested in leading a small group, small groups will be kicking off in the fall, um, you can uh, sign up to go through the orientation and you can lead a small group. Uh, to sign up, you can use a connect card that is in your worship guide or you can go on the website. Instead of saying, I want to join a group, you say, I want to lead a group and you will be signed up that way. And then, this is something I'm excited about, July 31st, the last Sunday of the month of July, we are going to have our church serve day. Somebody asked me yesterday, uh, Pastor Manny, are we going to be knocking on doors? The answer is no, we're not gonna be knocking on doors. If that's your uh, impression or your thought of what a serve day is, you are totally off. What we're gonna be doing is, we're gonna have a project, we're gonna tell you about what project, we're still working on that, we're going to have a project or projects in the city that we're going to go serve. So you might be going to clean a park, going to clean a school, going to clean a street, going to, we're going to do something for the community. How many believe that the church should not be confined to the four walls of the building? How many believe that? 
All right. Now, if you believe that, here's my challenge to you. Hey, let's act it out. Let's not, let's not just sit back and believe it and not put action to it. Let's act, uh, let's act that out. So on the 31st, we'll all be here. But instead of coming inside to worship, we're going to be outside, have a little prayer together, and we're going to go to the projects that we're going to be working on, uh, one or two or more projects, and we're going to serve on that day. And that's our worship to God by serving our community. I think that's a great thing, if you ask me. I think it is. All right. Enough of that. Um, we know that there are many people in our church right now that are feeling the impact of the current economic inflation. Um, you may be here and you're feeling that at your kitchen table. So I want to say this. I want to say this. If you are ever at a place where putting food on the table is a struggle, I want to beg you to please reach out. I want to encourage you to please reach out. Let us know about that. Uh, you can simply text the church number, which is the number you get text from. Just simply text something, whatever you feel comfortable texting, that will help us know that you need something. And we will keep that as discreet and as uh, honorable as we can be because nobody wants their business to be put out when they are down on their back. Am I right about that? Come on, church, give me a little witness here. Don't throw me out in the bus. Let me stand here by myself. Am I right about that? If I were in trouble, I wouldn't want the whole church to know what my business is. So I, I would never want to do that to somebody else and so we're simply asking, if you're going through a hard time, please don't let pride keep you away from getting help. Uh, this church started because we wanted to help people find hope, wanted to help people find community, and want to help people find purpose. This is how we find community. If you're going through something, and uh, maybe you can't put gas in your car, maybe you can't put food on the table, just let us know, and we will do the best we can to share with you, because that's what community should be about. That's what the church should be about. Who says amen to that? Um, and on the other hand, there are others who are blessed in our church. You have a job, you have an income, you're doing well, right? I want to encourage you, uh, maybe not even encourage, I want to challenge you, because the Bible challenges us sometimes. I want to challenge you to put God first in what you have. Amen. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9 and 10, here's what it says. It says, Honor the Lord with what? With your wealth and with the best part of how many things? Everything you produce. Your job is something you produce. An income is something that you produce, right? A commission is something that you produce. A bonus is something you produce. Even a gift, right? It says honor the Lord with uh, the best, with, with your wealth and with the best of everything you produce, but notice the outcome, notice the effect. You have the cost and then you have the effect. The effect of it is then, come on somebody, then, then he will fill your bonds with what? With grain and your vats will overflow with what? With good wine. Amen. Correct me if I'm wrong. But every single place in the Bible where I'm encouraged to give to God, there's always a promise of God blessing me in return. Now, how that blessing comes may be different. God blesses in different ways. But there is not a single verse in the Bible that says give and leaves it at that. It says give and it will be given back to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And some people take that to be money. It's going to be shaking over. It's going to come under your pillow. No, not always. So my word to you this morning, my challenge to you this morning is if you're blessed, uh, put God first. Put God first through your tithe. So let's practice. Let's practice this scripture. Let's practice honoring God with what we have. Let's practice giving God our best, the best part of what we have, and then Let's trust God, watch this, to replenish whatever we give out, to put it back for us. Amen? Until we what? We overflow. That's what it says. Amen?
Um, for those of you who are consistent givers and tithers, thank you so much for supporting the ministry. You are the ones that keep this ministry going. And for those of you who are still uh, maybe praying about it, that's fine. Uh, ask the Lord and let Him speak to your heart because that's the only way to do it the right way. If you do it out of pressure, there's no blessing in that. If you do it out of guilt, there's no blessing in that. But blessing comes when you hear God's voice and you obey God's voice. And, um, and when God speaks to you, then it doesn't, your circumstance doesn't matter, right? Because God knows your circumstance better. Amen? All right, today we want to honor fathers. And so if you are a father or a father figure or godfather or step-up father, come on, somebody. We don't have stepfathers. We step-up fathers, right? And if you're a father-to-be, so you're expecting to be a father, please stand. Please stand. All those fathers, please stand. Come on. Come on. Remain standing. Remain standing. Remain standing. Hey, today we honor you uh, as fathers. Fathers sometimes get a bad rap, but there are many fathers out there who are really holding it down, doing the right thing like you. You are men and uh, men of God, men of integrity. And today we honor you. I want to invite my wife, Rebecca, to come over and, and pray for the fathers. But before she prays, I want to let you know we have a present for you. We have a gift. They are at the tables here in the auditorium in the, uh, on the, in the hallways. A uh, nice gift. Please don't live without one. Just grab one on your way. Uh, that's just a token from our heart to you for all the good work that you're doing as a priest, as a prophet, and as a king of your home. Come on, let's give it up to them one more time. All right. um, so again, happy Father's Day to all of you. I'm going to pray over the fathers, then also over the service before we begin. Father, I thank you for um, all of the men in the Connect Church, Father God, all of the fathers. I thank you for the fathers that we have as well, Lord. Um, you have given them a very specific role and responsibility. Um, it requires your wisdom. It requires your direction, Father. And so first I pray that you will continue to give wisdom and direction to them as they fulfill their roles as a father. I pray that no matter how they feel about the way that they're fulfilling it now, I pray that you will um, enable them to continue to grow in you, um, for those who don't know you, to find you so that you can help them in their journey as a father. Um, and continue to help us to see you as the good father that you are and to allow you to change us, to mold us, to make us more like you. Thank you, Father, for today and for the service. I pray that you will also um, just help us to be open to your, your spirit to lead us um, and to be able to hear what you have for us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Are you ready for God's word this morning? All right, all right, let's ride. Today is part number five of our series on the God that I never knew, the God I never knew. This series, for those who may have missed uh, the other parts of the series, the series is the, about the Holy Spirit. It's about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God, but not everybody knows that. Many don't know him. And our foundation scripture for this series is found in Acts chapter 19. And um, in Acts chapter 19, we read, while Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions until he reached Ephesus on the coast where he found several believers. Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? He asked them. No, they replied. We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. So there you have it. This is the premise for this series. This is where this series comes from. The Holy Spirit is God but not many people know him. So on week one, we talked about why we need the Holy Spirit. Why, why do we even need the Holy Spirit? Uh, as Christians, we are uh, Christ followers. The Christian life is impossible to live without the Holy Spirit. He's the one who enables us to forgive. He's the one who enables us to be able to trust God even when the circumstances don't make sense. People who don't know God will sometimes question your faith. How can you trust God? How can you say you are believing God or trusting God in a situation like that? They are not able to conceptualize that because that's what the Holy Spirit does in the heart of the believer. Week two, we looked at who the Holy Spirit is, 
we discover that the Holy Spirit is a person. Uh, he is God, and he is our constant companion. He never lives. He never leaves, I should say, no matter what we do. Even when we grieve him, he is grieved, he is quiet, and sometimes he can be inactive, but he will never leave because he is under covenant to be with us forever. Week three, we looked at the work of the Holy Spirit in the world, in people who have not yet said yes to Jesus. They've not yet made a commitment to cross the line of faith and come into faith. The Holy Spirit still works on them. He works around them and he works with them. And then last week, week four, we looked at the work of the Holy Spirit in the believer. Those who have crossed the line of faith, who've said yes to Jesus, the Holy Spirit dwells in them and works in them to bring out Christ, to bring out the character of Christ, to bring out the image of Jesus through them. The ultimate goal of the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer is to make the believer look like Jesus. Okay? That's the goal. That's the goal. And he will never stop. Now, for, 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 for many of us, we may feel like this is taking so long. Guess what? It takes a lifetime. It is a work that will always continue. And this morning, we're going to be talking about gifts. We want to talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And um, we're going to start out this morning in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're talking about gifts, so if you're seeing anything around here that looks like a gift, that's why, because we're talking about a gift. You didn't notice that, did you? 1 Corinthians chapter 12, here's what the Bible says. Um, actually, this is, this is the Apostle Paul, who is one of the founding fathers of the church, he is a great apostle that has so much revelation from Jesus, and he writes this letter to the Corinthian believers, and he says, now, about the spiritual gifts, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be what? Uninformed. I do not want you to be uninformed. So why does Paul say that he does not want the Corinthian believers to be uninformed? That's because... Many people were uninformed, many of them were uninformed about spiritual gifts. And my question to you is, do you think it's the same today? Yeah, yeah, same today. A lot of people are not informed about spiritual gifts. What are spiritual gifts? How do you operate in them? What, what, what's, what, what do they mean? So notice, notice, notice here what he said. He said, now about the gifts of the Spirit. Somebody say gifts of the Spirit. So that means the Holy Spirit gives gifts. He does. The Holy Spirit gives gifts. And the gifts of the Spirit are not the same like or as the fruit of the Spirit. How many have ever heard of the fruit of the Spirit? Okay. Now, a lot of people say fruits of the Spirit. Okay, so let me, let me kind of uh, make you a little bit of a Bible uh, a student this morning. There is nothing like fruits of the Spirit. It's fruit of the Spirit. It's one fruit. It's one fruit. Okay, <clears throat> uh, but, but the gift of the Spirit is not the same like the fruit of the Spirit because the fruit of the Spirit speaks of character. It's a character development. The Bible says the fruit of the Spirit is love, is patience, is, and it goes on to name all those things, right? That's character. But the gift speaks of charisma. It speaks of enabling. It speaks of what you can do. The fruit is a mark of maturity. The fruit, the, the gift, is a demonstration of abilities. See the difference? One is maturity, one is ability. How many know just because you can do something doesn't mean you're mature? In fact, sometimes it takes maturity not to do. Am I right? So, so 
I would rather manifest the fruit of the Spirit than the gift of the Spirit. Because you can manifest the gift and not look like Jesus. But if you manifest the fruit, you will be like Jesus. Are you with me this morning? So the question is, what are spiritual gifts then? Well, spiritual gifts are special enablements or special abilities given by the Holy Spirit so that believers can do what God has called them to do. See, you are on this earth for a reason. God put you here on purpose, and he put you with a purpose. And in order to fulfill that purpose, there are things that God has gifted you with. Right? Spiritual gifts are supernatural tools. Supernatural tools. Listen to those words. Supernatural tools that is given to the believer so that the believer can function, can serve others. Supernatural tools. Christianity is more than just telling a story about a man who died on a cross and now you believe in him and no. Christianity has a supernatural dimension to it. Right? Otherwise, how would you explain that Jesus said you will lay your hands on the sick and the sick will recover? How would you explain that you pray for somebody and they get well? How would you explain that? How would you explain that you talk to God in your room and something happens in your life? a direct response to the prayer. How would you explain that all the phenomena, the things that we see happen when believers get together to worship? How would you explain when someone who is totally adverse to Christianity, someone who is so mad at Christians that he arrests them and he throws them in prison and he kills them, how would you explain that one day his life turns around and he leaves everything behind? And he preaches that same gospel that he was persecuting. It's because Christianity has a supernatural dimension to it. So the Holy Spirit gives gifts. And spiritual gifts are different from natural abilities or natural talents. In that they are supernatural and they're given to believers. Non-believers may have natural talents, but we can never call them spiritual gifts because spiritual gifts are what the Holy Spirit gives the believer. Now, the Holy Spirit can take a natural talent. When someone gets saved, the Holy Spirit can redeem that natural talent and make it become a spiritual gift. Are you with me this morning? And you cannot determine your gifts, but you can only discover them. Your gifts are determined by the Holy Spirit, but it's your responsibility to discover what they are. So let's go back to our scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and let's jump over to verse 4, where Paul begins to talk a little bit more about the spiritual gifts. He says, there are different kinds of spiritual gifts, but the same Spirit is the source of them all. Notice that. There are different kinds of spirit uh, gifts, different kinds. We're gifted differently but they all come from the same Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but we serve the same Lord. God works in different ways, but it is the same God who does the work in all of us. Verse 7 says, A spiritual gift <clears throat> is given to each one so that we can do what? We can help each other. Notice that. Notice, notice that there are different gifts and there are different ministries, but the Holy Spirit is the one that is behind them all. And therefore, we should never despise or reject others simply because they are gifted differently than we are. We all have different gifts. No gift is superior and no gift is inferior. And one of the areas where there are excesses or excess practices in the church. When I say the church, I'm talking about the church with a capital C, the body of Christ. One area where there's a lot of excesses is in the area of the gifts. Some people exalt some gifts 
to an extreme. I, I grew up in an environment like that. In the environment that I grew up in, you were not really considered a serious believer if you didn't speak in tongues. You know, you got to speak in tongues. In fact, they called it the evidence of the bap. Come on, if you, if, you, if you know what I'm talking about, help me out. Don't let me stand here by myself. All right, let's finish this sentence for me. Evidence of the baptism of the Holy Spirit. No, Holy Ghost. There you go. Gotta call him Holy Ghost. Because Holy Spirit is too light. You're not, you're not respecting him. I grew up in an environment like that. And so everything was about tongues. And we would have a church service like this. And somebody will come on stage and just in order to pray, will be praying in tongues. And the rest of us are standing there not understanding what they're talking about. Now, I absolutely believe in tongues. But I also believe that it is totally unproductive for you to speak in tongues and the rest of us have no clue what you're talking about. Hey, watch this. As ik hier vandaag kom spreken tegen jullie, en jullie hebben geen idee wat ik zeg, who zou dat voelen? I think only one person in this congregation knows exactly what I'm talking about. Anna, can you interpret that for them? No, I'm kidding. So watch this, watch this. I just spoke Dutch to you, right? But it's a language that I learned. So, but that's the same way you felt when I said that. It's the same way people feel when you're speaking in tongues and nobody knows what you're talking about. See, the church has excess and extreme practices around the gift of the Holy Spirit. And as a result of that, some churches have completely shut down and shut out the Holy Spirit and the gift of the Spirit. Okay. Now, while we are not for excesses, I will tell you that we cannot deny the gift of the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? We cannot deny the gift of the Holy Spirit. Uh, we, 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 we cannot do without the Holy Spirit. We cannot do without his enabling. We cannot do without his power. The Holy Spirit is the force, the power, the person behind this church, behind this ministry. Right? Right? I want you to know that. Know, know that. The Holy Spirit is the one behind this ministry. Uh, I know you don't have this on your notes. Paul said something in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. Paul said, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with what? Come on, church, with what? A demonstration of what? Of the Spirit's power. In other words, supernatural, right? So that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. Man, love that, love that. The power behind our ministry is the Spirit of God. This ministry or no ministry should ever stand because of the uh, skillful communication of a person. Should never stand because of that. The lights and the, and the gear and the music, that's not the power behind this church. The power behind this church is the Holy Spirit. If you take away the music, if you take away the instruments, if you take away the lights, I promise you, the Holy Spirit is still able to move. Amen. Are you with me this morning? Yes. So now let's take a look at the different gifts that Paul talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Let's jump to verse number 8. So now he's beginning to list the gifts. I'm going to walk you through this list of gifts. And uh, as we go through this uh, list of gifts, and by the way, uh, they are in your worship guide as well, I want you to take note of some of the gifts that you might have. Okay, so it says in verse 8, to one, or to one person, the Spirit gives the ability to give wise advice. Wise advice. Now, in the King James Bible, or the New King James Bible, it calls that the word of what? wisdom, the word of wisdom. So this is talking about, this is talking about supernatural ability or insight to know and to determine the right course of action that is in line with God's plan and purpose. 
This is not just talking about wise counsel as in I have some experience I can give you wise counsel. No, this is a divine insight into what I'm supposed to do that is in line with God's plan for my life. And then it goes on and says, to another, the same spirit gives a special knowledge. Notice that. Not just knowledge, but special knowledge. The King James calls this the word of knowledge. Supernatural ability to know, watch this, what is happening now and what happened in the past. Word of knowledge does not know what happens in the future. That's prophecy. Word of knowledge is I walk into a person, um, I walk up to a person, and I can tell what's going on just supernaturally. Just supernaturally. I told you, I shared a testimony with you guys a few weeks ago. I went to pray for a lady, and, um, and um, as I sat down in the conference room to pray for her, I just felt the Holy Spirit said, um, I asked her to, to talk to me, and I felt the Holy Spirit said, write it down. But I had no pen. So I said, can you grab me something to write down? As she got up to go grab me something to write down, I just knew in my spirit that there was a spirit behind her situation. I knew it. I just knew it. I don't know how I knew it, but I knew it, I knew it so much that I could put my name behind it. Just knew it. Supernatural knowing, word of knowledge. And when she came back to sit down, I said, I'm not going to need the pen anymore. I already know what to do. She said, you do? I said, yeah. I said, I'm going to pray for you next year. This time, you're going to have a baby boy. You're going to have a baby. Because I knew. I just knew. All right? So that's a gift of word of knowledge. And then verse 9 says, the same spirit gives faith to another. Notice here, all believers are supposed to have faith, true or false. But at the same time, faith is also a gift of the Spirit. So this is a different kind of faith. This is not the faith to be saved. This is the special ability to believe God against all odds. Elijah demonstrated this, this, this kind of gift when he stood in front of Ahab and he said to Ahab, even though it hadn't rained for over three years, he said to Ahab, go get ready. It's about to pour. Right? He spoke it. He believed it. Spoke it. Gift of faith. And then it goes on. The Bible goes on and says, and to someone else, the one spirit gives the gift of healing. This is the supernatural ability to pray for the sick and to to see them get well, become well. It's a gift of healing. Verse 10 goes on. He gives to one person the power to perform miracles and another the ability to prophesy, the power to perform miracles. I actually like the way the King James puts it. The King James Bible calls it the working of miracles. So in reality, there is nothing like gift of miracles. It doesn't exist. It's the working of miracles. Somebody say, isn't that the same? Actually, it's not. Because working of miracles imply that you've got work to do in it. See, many times we just want to sit and see God do it. But in every miracle, there is the human element. Somebody has to stand in the gap and pray and believe God for something. If you're not willing to believe God for it, it may be God's will, but it may not come to pass. Are you with me? So I like it. I like it when the Bible says the working of miracles. Because you got to work it. You got to work God's word. And miracles happen. What is a miracle? A miracle is a temporary suspension of the law of nature. Something that nature can, it can be, but God can make it be. How many know God can make it be? A virgin, listen, a virgin can't have a baby. It's against the law of nature because the natural process of having a baby is that a sperm has to fertilize the egg and then there's conception. There's a fetus. But when God is involved, he can bypass the law of nature. I don't know what you may be facing in your life. I hope that this gives you hope and courage to believe God that we serve a God who does miracles. Who does things that are impossible to explain? And then it goes on and says another, the ability to prophesy. 
Well, prophecy is simply the Holy Spirit's enabling to be able to foretell the future, to speak about the future. How many of you have ever received prophecy before and it came to pass? All right, some people here? Okay. But notice what it says. He gives someone else the ability to discern whether a message is from the Spirit of God. Some people call this uh, the gift of discernment. But that's not what the Bible calls it. The Bible calls it the discerning of spirits. Okay? In this translation, it calls it uh, discerning a message from the Spirit of God. So, so the key thing about discernment is it's not about reading people. Okay? Some people go around being nosy in other people's business and say, I have a gift of discernment. No, you don't. You're just nosy. Because the gift of discerning of spirit has nothing to do with people. It has to do with the spirit behind the person. It has to do with the spirit behind what you're hearing. Not the person. Are you with me? It goes on. It says, still, another person is given the ability to speak in unknown languages. We've already covered that. While another is given the ability to interpret what is being said. So tongues, or unknown language, is when you speak a language you've never learned, but you did it through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Interpretation is when you interpret a language you've never learned naturally. Those two gifts, according to Scripture, should go together in a public setting. Amen. Who says amen to that? Amen. In a public setting. Because otherwise, it makes no sense. There's no benefit for those who are... Who are Listening. Now, some have referred to this list that we just went through as the, the nine gifts of the Spirit. How many have ever heard it being described like that before? The nine gifts of the Spirit. Well, uh, to say that would suggest that these are the only gifts that the Holy Spirit gives, but that's not true. This list is not exhaustive. There are other gifts. If you look at verse 28, Paul continues with uh, two more gifts. He says in verse 28, here are some of the parts. God has appointed for the church. First, our apostles. Second, our prophets. Third, our teachers. And then those who do miracles, those who have the gift of healing. Sounds like he's repeating what he's told us already. And then he says, those who can do what? Help others. Another translation calls it the gift of help. All right? The gift of help is those who have the special ability to be able to play a supportive role in helping others fulfill what God has called them to do. And then Paul continues and says, and those who have gift of leadership. Notice that. Leadership is a gift. Some translations call it administration. What is that? It's, it's the ability to understand the immediate and the long-term needs in the body of Christ. And then be able to effectively put systems in place to meet those needs. That's the gift of administration. That's the gift of administration. So you see, in 1 Corinthians 12, we had nine gifts. In, uh, in verse, eight, uh, uh, verse 8, and, and, uh, and uh, was that verse 18 or what? We had verse 28, thank you. In verse 28, we had two more. And now, in Romans chapter 12, he's about to give us some more, some more gifts. Here's another list of gifts. Now, we don't have the time to read all the scriptures, so I'm going to make the scripture references. And by the way, they're your worship guide. I would encourage you to look them up, but we just want to kind of highlight the gift. In Romans 12, uh, uh, 13, uh, 3, it talks about the gift of ministry or the, the gift of serving. What's that? It's the ability to identify unmet needs and to make use of available resources to meet those needs. Then you read further, it talks about the gift of ex Exhortation. Somebody in our church calls it the gift of ex extortion. <laughs> the gift of exhortation. All right? This is the ability to speak words of comfort, consolation, encouragement, and counsel to others in such a way that they feel uplifted, they feel inspired, and they feel empowered. You know, if you are around someone who has a gift of uh, exhortation, they always lift you up. You go to them feeling down, you leave them feeling pumped up because of the gift of exhortation. 
And then it talks about the gift of giving. The gift of giving. Are all believers supposed to give? Okay, I'm going to ask it again. It's not a trick question. Just want to know how much you know the word. Are all believers supposed to give? Yes. But there are some of us who've been given a special ability to go above and beyond in our giving. We're commanded to give. It's a command. But those who have the gift of giving, they can invest overflowing financial resources into the kingdom. We have a few of them in our church. And quite frankly, I'll be honest with you, if it weren't for them, I don't think, I don't know. Let me not say I don't think. I don't know how we would have made it. God would have made a way, of course, but I don't know how. But there are few people in our church who've been so generous to support. Then it talks about the gift of leadership. The gift of leadership is the ability to lead, uh, to be able to attract, unite, and inspire others to work together in unity to pursue a common goal in the kingdom of God. It talks about the gift of mercy. The gift of mercy is the ability to feel genuine compassion and empathy for those who are distressed and suffering to translate their concerns into practical and meaningful help. That's in Romans 12. But then if you go to 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 9 and 10, we find other spiritual gifts also. It's like the list never ends. In 1 Peter, it talks about the gift of hospitality. That's the ability to open up one's heart and one's arms and one's home to others. Right? Especially strangers, making them feel loved and welcome. Then in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, most of you would know this one, especially if you come from a church background. This one is where the, the one that is often referred to as the five-fold ministry. The five-fold ministry talks about the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher. Let me teach you something trivia this morning, a little trivia. Everybody, put up your right hand. Put up your right hand. Everybody, put up your right hand. This is how you remember the five-fold ministries. Because you have five fingers, and they all represent the five-fold ministry. The thumb is the apostle. The apostle has the special ability to pioneer and oversee all the other gifts and oversee the body of Christ. So, in other words, the thumb is the only finger that can touch all the other fingers. The apostle can do it all. Okay. Then you have the prophet, and that's your index finger. The prophet is the one who gets in your face and tells you that's where God wants you to go or stop doing that. A lot of self-proclaimed apostles like to do that, don't they? You, you go into hell. All right. And then you have your middle finger. You got to be careful how you do that middle finger because that might be, okay? Be careful with that. So, but you notice the middle finger is the tallest of all your fingers. Am I right? So that's the evangelist. The evangelist is the one who goes further than everybody else. The evangelist travels further. He goes to further places. And then you have the ring finger is the pastor. Why is that? When you're getting married, who joins you? Who puts you together? Which finger do you put a ring on? There you go. That ring finger. He's the a, he's a union guy. He's the one who, who makes things happen, right? <laughs> And then you have the pinky is the teacher. All right? How many of you, try to, how many of you ever try to kind of clean your ear with your pinky? Yeah, like kind of put it in some, stuck it in somewhere, right? That's the teacher when you want something broken down, when you want something, someone who goes deep and pulls it out. Who does it? The teacher. So now you know the five-fold ministry, right? And then there's one more gift I want to show you this morning before we pray. That's in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 7. You never heard of this gift, most likely. It's the gift of celibacy. Does anybody know what that is? It's the special ability to remain single and enjoy it. Hello, somebody. I said hello, somebody. So that they can devote themselves completely to the kingdom service. That's what a celibacy, celibacy is about. Now, obviously, many of us didn't have that gift. Right? 
And some people don't know that that's a spiritual gift, but if you read 1 Corinthians 7, 7, Paul says it. Paul calls it a gift. He said, not everyone has this gift. It's a gift. Now, if you're taking notes, I want to close with this. I want you to write down what's most important about this gift. We just went through the list of gifts, but here's what's most important about this gift. I have, I have a few, few seconds to go. Can you, can you give me three more minutes? Okay, thank you. Number one, every believer has a spiritual gift. How many believers? I said, how many believers? So you have a spiritual gift. In fact, in fact, every single believer in this room has at least three spiritual gifts. At least three. At least three. I've been in ministry for over 20-something years. I have never met one individual who only has a one gift. Never. Never. An average person has at least three spiritual gifts. Number two. Number two. If you're writing notes, write this down. Your gifts indicate your assignment. Your gift does what? Indicates your assignment. So whatever gift you have are indicators of what God wants you to do with your life. Here's the tragedy. Here's where I, what I find tragic. A lot of people are doing a lot of good things with their lives, but if it is not involving the gifts God has given you, I can almost be certain and to tell you that you've missed your assignment. Why would God give you a gift that is not being used? Why would God put something in you and then send you over there? Your gifts are an indication of what God wants you to do with your life. And there are many good things that you can do with your life that are not the thing for you. Did you get that? There are many good things that you can do with your life, but they are not the thing for you. The thing for you will match the gift because God wired you, God shaped you the way he shaped you so you can fit into your assignment. The Holy Spirit does not give useless or redundant gifts. He doesn't give meaningful, meaningless gifts. You know, how many of you love shopping for gifts? How many of you love giving gifts? How many of you love giving gifts? How many of you love receiving gifts? Okay. <laughs> All right now. Whenever you are shopping for gifts, let me ask you this. What are you thinking about? What's on your mind when you're shopping for a gift for somebody? You're thinking about what they need. Hey, what do they need? What do they need? What do they need? Am I right about that? The best gifts are the ones that match what the person needs. So why would the Holy Spirit give you a gift that you don't need? So, what's most important when it comes to the gift of the Spirit? Number one, every believer has a gift. Number two, <clears throat> your gift indicates your assignment. And number three, God wants you to use your spiritual gifts. Spiritual gifts are not for decoration. Okay? They are for use. Look at this. Look at this box. Look at this box. Isn't this pretty? Come on, be honest. Isn't this pretty? I, I, I like it. It's so well done. Nice. Nice. If I gave this to you as a gift, as pretty as this box is, would you let it stay like this? What's the first thing you do when you get this box? You open it up. You rip it apart. You know why? Because gifts, no matter how nice the wraps are, they are never meant to stay wrapped. Never meant to stay wrapped. When the Holy Spirit gave you a gift, He didn't mean for that gift to stay wrapped. He wants you to use it. So number one, everybody has a gift. Number two, your gift is an indication of your assignment. Number three, God wants you to use your gift. And number four, you can discover your spiritual gift by going through our connect steps. There's a typo in your outline on that last sentence, that last, that last point. Uh, the missing word is the word through. So God wants you to discover your gift, to use your gift, and you can discover your gift by going through our connect steps, right? Connect 1.1, you discover our church family. Connect 1.0, sorry. Connect 2.0, you discover the keys to spiritual maturity, spiritual growth. Connect 3.0, 
you discover your gift. A lot of Christians don't know what their gift is. Let me ask you, do you know what your gifts are? And are you deploying them? Good, good. It took me years to discover my gift. I thought my gift was to be a preacher. So when I heard a really good preacher preach, I wanted to be like them. I heard another good preacher preach, oh, maybe I should be like that one. For years, I wanted to be a preacher until I discovered that my gift is not a gift of preaching. I have the gift of teaching. I have the gift of explaining. And I'm comfortable now in my gift. Now, I'm going to say something right now, and it might sound like pride, but trust me, it's not pride, because I know where my gift comes from. It doesn't come from me. But what I'm about to say is my confidence in who gave me the gift. Here's what I'm going to say. I don't care what stage I'm on. I don't care who shares the stage with me. I'm comfortable being in my gift. I'm never intimidated. I'm never intimidated. Yeah. Yeah. I am the best version of me when I operated my gift. Are you with me this morning? And then Connect 4.0 is to discover where you can deploy your gift, where you can use your gift. Now, to make it easy for you, uh, 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 July 16, we are combining all of that together. We call it the fast track, Connect Steps Fast Track. It's on the screen. Take a picture of that and register for it today. Here's a question. What stops you, though? God has given you a gift. You don't know what it is, and we have a tool, an effective tool to help you discover it, and you haven't taken advantage of that. Man, I don't know what else to do. Every single person should want to go through this because it's a service to you to help you discover what God has put in you. Did you receive it? Did you receive something today? Come on, give the Lord a hand of praise. I love it. I love it. I love to teach God's Word to you. You're such a wonderful, wonderful church family, congregation. I know God has great things in store for you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you this moment, God, for your Word. We thank you, God, for uh, anointing your people to receive this Word today. God, you've put gifts in us, and uh, only you can bring out what you put in us. So we... Surrender ourselves to you, God. And we make ourselves willing to go through the process, to learn, to use the tools that you have provided. God, I pray that the outcome of it is that we will begin to fulfill our purpose and walk in our assignment. We pray these things in your name. And while our heads are still bowed, I want to give this opportunity to anybody who's here. You've never yet met Jesus Christ, the Lord of your life. In other words, you're not yet saved. You're not yet born again and you want to surrender your heart to Jesus, you want to say yes to Jesus today, if that's you, I want you to repeat this prayer after me right where you are. Remember that God loves you. Remember that God, um, God sent Jesus to die on the cross for this very reason, so that you can come into his family, so that you can become a child of God, so that you can be forgiven, so that you can have peace with God. And this is your opportunity. We, every single one who is a believer in Christ, at one point or the other, we have had to make the same decision, and today could be your day. Repeat this prayer after me, and church family, let's repeat it together and encourage anyone who's praying this prayer for the first time. Say, so Lord Jesus, I thank you for loving me and dying on the cross for me. Today, I say yes to your love, and I invite you into my heart and into my life to be my Lord and the leader of my life. Thank you, Lord, for hearing my prayer in Jesus' name. And everybody say amen. amen. Would you give the Lord a hand of praise for that this morning? Yeah. Uh, listen, if you prayed that prayer and you really meant it, I want to let you know God heard it. Congratulations. You are a child of God. Amen. We want to help you, though. We want to help you in your journey with God. If you would text the word CONNECT to the number 
You're going to get a link. Fill out that link. Let us know that you prayed that prayer. We're going to send you out a book this week, um, A Fresh Start with God. That's what it's called. And it's a book that will help you in your walk with God. If anyone needs prayers after the service, please come to the front. We'll be up here. We'll be praying for you. No need to come to church with a heavy heart. I say this every week and live with a heavy heart. Let's come forward. Our prayer partners are here, and they can pray with you. Amen. Church, would you please stand? Would you please stand? Did you get something today? All right. And now, may the Lord God bless you. May the Lord God make his face to shine upon you. May the Lord God give you peace in all your ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Church is dismissed. Thank you.